be a, a new and regular segment where we do a profile on really great organizations and the people that are part of that. And, you know, top nonprofits, our tagline is actually learning from the best nonprofit organizations and leaders. So what better way to learn than from others? That's, the, that's our attitude. Today, we are joined by David Robinson, who is the communications director at an amazing organization called Manufacturing Renaissance in Chicago. And he, David, um, you also have a special guest there. I have a special guest, mm -hmm. Mr. Rakeem Buford. He's one of our graduates and one of our superstars. Wow. Well, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Rakeem. Right. Nice to see you. Um, so it's funny, you know, on your on your website, because we do like to keep things brief and you're a master communicator. Um, <laughs> on, on the website for Manufacturing Re Renaissance, it literally says that the organization's a nonprofit that promotes advanced manufacturing as a springboard for sustainable development. So yes. David, <laughs> could you break that down and kind of put that in real world language? What does what does that mean? If you Absolutely. Um, so the RC, our uh, uh, executive director, Dan Swinney, came from um, the manufacturing community. He was uh, a laborer at a big factory, and um, in the late seventies and eighties, he noticed that the industry, you know, they started closing all these these companies, and he he too eventually lost his position. and And he wondered, well, what is going on here? Because uh, at the time, of course. The manufacturing industry really kind of under uh, was the, the the supported community development. It, it was kind of job, of course, where you could go and buy a couple of uh, uh, cars and have a nice home, send your kid to college without having uh, uh, post secondary education, right. and it, it felt like life was good. And then when they moved the low skill labor offshore, they began to move close these entities down. Mm -hmm. So my boss said, well, what, what is going on? Is just manufacturing gone from the United States? And so he kind of took it all upon himself to begin to study this issue. And what he found was that, yes, the, um, the large corporate interest found that they could make more money on Wall Street mm -hmm. with pressing a couple of buttons on uh, uh, computers, and they did not have to now have have these massive facilities with you know incredible labor forces and have to deal with all that goes with that they could still make their money without all that mm -hmm. so what's left are the small value added um privately held and often you know 100 or less employees that provide the the the, the skilled high precision products and pieces for big industry so all around us in plain sight there are all these little little factories and uh, you know little manufacturing plants and they pay excellent money um, much like the older version low skill you mm -hmm. can get a fifty thousand to eighty thousand dollar a year uh, job including benefits the kind of money that you can go buy a home and make investments and reinvest in your community so when we, we talk about sustainable development mm -hmm. what we're really saying is if we are able to fill the skills gap and I forgot to mention this that all these little entities in order to, to remain competitive they've had to automate they've had to become fairly high tech with respect to the uh, the skill sets necessary for them to be to, to uh, create and manufacture their products um, so as a result the uh, the training necessary uh, to, to, to fill those jobs is, has become pretty intense and there are certain industry recognized certifications that are required for you to be able to run the machinery, run the computers, so on and so forth. But there are 20,000, just right here in the Chicago area, 20,000 vacant, high-skill jobs, and the manufacturers are desperate to fill them. Mm -hmm. So we said, you know, our agency uh, said, well, there's got to be a way that we can help fill that skills gap and at the same time provide training for communities that have been left behind, disenfranchised, and, um, and are suffering the most. So uh, we decided not only are we going to address this skills gap issue, but we're going to put a program in one of the toughest neighborhoods in the country, which is uh, Austin on the west side of Chicago, so that we couldn't, you know, so that no one could ever say, well, you can do it in the suburbs, but you could never do it mm -hmm. in a tough, tough community. Well, we started in a tough community. So 
what we've been able to accomplish, I think, is uh, is evident that if you if you build it, if you create it, and if you really focus on providing the right kind of training with cultural competency, technical competency, and curricular competency, uh, and you can constantly communicate with the manufacturers to make sure we're meeting their needs, we, we can come together. And that's what's happened. So insightful and, you know, forward thinking to be looking at um, an industry that almost seems it's ailing, right? Or it, on the, on the surface, it seems like it's the kind of industry that's going away and dying, but really it, it's, it could be vibrant. There's a big skills gap, as you mentioned, and an opportunity there in Chicago to really um, work with untapped potential, you know, people, um, and I guess that's where you come in. Rakim, tell us, how did you get involved with Manufacturing Renaissance? Um, I started going to Austin Back then, it was Austin Polytechnical Academy in 2008, and um, I was a freshman. And I really didn't get into manufacturing until my senior year. Mm -hmm. I went there all four years, but uh, um, I didn't really show an interest in it. It wasn't really that interesting to me. It was easy to me, but I, um, I never thought I'd do it in life. So I never paid attention in class, and I'll skip class, and <laughs> someday I didn't even go to school. So, but yeah, senior year, I had to make a decision on um, whether to work or go to college after I brought my grades back up from skipping school so much. And um, at the time, my girlfriend she didn't have nobody to take care of her, so I decided to get a job. I went and talked to the counselors, Manufacturing Renaissance, mm -hmm. and um, they helped me write my resume and took me to job interview. Well, before they, they taught me how to what to do at an interview and how to act and what to wear and what questions to ask and take notes and all of that. And then they took me on my interview. Um, first job, I didn't really like it. I didn't get that one. Then a week before graduating, no, not even a week, Two days before graduation, um, they took me to a company called Pache Airbrushing, and um, the company, it just seemed way better, and I ended up getting a job, um, and I started working there that Monday after I graduated. I graduated on a Saturday, I started working Monday, and... Uh, wow. <laughs> and how long have you been there now? Uh, it'll be five years in June. Five years. And what's what's the name of the company again, and what do they make? Pache Airbrushing. We make airbrushes for um, special effects, uh, movies, uh, tanning. I, I, this one lady, she's we making special airbrushes. She want to use us for uh, cookies and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah, we use it for a lot. But that's really it's so that's what's interesting about manufacturing. And I, I grew up outside of Pittsburgh in a steel town that. David and I chatted about this a bit where it just it devastated, you know, when the steel industry went away um, and then compounding, my father worked at GM, so that plant also went away. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's weird when you see that go away, but then you see the innovation of people and their businesses and it, the, ne the necessity for this woman with cookies, for example, right? And she wants to have an airbrush that she can use specifically and you still have to be able to create these things. Um, but, yeah. the, but to work in those plants, you need a higher level of skill than what used to be the, the case. And that's amazing. Um, did you, the, I guess my question originally, sorry, Rakeem, my question, I got off so I are a little off track there. Um, did you envision working at being a part of an org, a company like that whenever you were? No. You, when, uh, would you have ever guessed you were going to be doing this and being there for five years and learning what you're learning? No. Nah, when I was young, when I was about 15, 16, I didn't think I was going to make it to be 18 because of the, you know, the things that I did that a lot of other kids are, are doing now to, you know, uh, survive and, you know, you know, certain things that you got to do. And yeah, I didn't think I was going to be 18 and I definitely wouldn't have thought I would 
have a job or, you know, have mm-hmm. my own apartment or car or ain't none of the stuff I have. I never thought I'd have none of that. I, I was curious, too, like, given this opportunity and your, really, your ability and your work ethic to to make this work for you. I mean, it's not like somebody handed you this job and you've, you know, you, you got it um, right. for any of it. But what, have you ever thought about what your future would look like if, if you had not gone this path and, you know, if you had maybe just continued skipping school or going along with other friends who, I don't know. Um, what would that I look know, like? I know for a fact it would be just like the how a lot of other people I went to high school with, the same corner that they stood on to sell drugs in, in high school, they still stand on those same corners now. It's like they haven't made any progress in life. If anything, they went backwards. And I know that's what, exactly where I'd be. Wow. Yeah, that, that's an image that really says a lot, too. You know, thinking of somebody standing on the same place for all those years. Yeah, so, yeah that's profound, isn't it? That's, it is. It totally is. And, and Amy, on this, um, I was thinking manufacturing itself as a, as a segment may only represent about 8% of the, uh, the, the total workforce. But, you know, I, we do a lot of reading in this area, and it, it represents over 15% of the country's GDP. And every manufacturing job supports, and this is according to the National Association of Manufacturers, supports another five to ten uh, additional jobs, truck drivers, you know, uh, um, operators. Uh, there's all these these other positions, while a service job is only, only creates 1.2 additional jobs. And unfortunately, wow. IT, and sorry all you IT guys out there, barely creates one additional job. Wow. Yeah, it's such a huge ecosystem. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to ask David, too, what I wanted to ask you, um, because there are so many different stakeholders, right? You've got your, I mean, really, you're taking a, an ailing manufacturing industry. You're taking a, um, a community as well. You're trying to break this cycle of poverty, and, and you're bringing the two, linking the two together to benefit both. Um, and so that's a lot of things going on. Um, what in your experience there, um, and knowing that the people watching this are working at nonprofits or thinking about maybe starting up a nonprofit or they're, you know, they like to be volunteer, they like to give, um, you know, what, what suggestions do you have for others out there who have multiple stakeholders? How can you get everybody to be like, I don't know, on the same page and get everyone to rally behind and, I guess, can get that momentum together. Yeah, so it, I think a lot of it has to do with recognizing what each of the entities is good at and what their real mission, mm-hmm. what their, their drive is about, and respecting and trying to figure out how we can collaborate so that we strengthen both, you know, both of our missions. And in, in our case, there was the education community mm-hmm. um, that that we work closely with. Labor is involved with us. Uh, obviously, the, the business, the manufacturers themselves, they, they had a need in this. Um, the uh, community, you know, has, has a great need for sustainable, uh, real kind of life-changing mm-hmm. uh, uh, opportunity. And, and then that, that kind of filters out into the larger community as well, where they begin to see the positive impact if we can make this stuff work. Mm-hmm. And, it, and then it grows exponentially if, if we can get all the partners around this thing to, to kind of work in unison. Wow. And, and that's a great segue. Uh, so moving from that, what you've been able to do in unison, um, what are the next steps? Are you going to be replicating this program elsewhere? Is that the hope? Plan. Yes, we're actually kind of taking a a, a two prong approach to to our work. We've uh, been we hired a consulting agency to teach us to be consultants, um, and we've uh, the city of Chicago uh, public school system now finally after some struggling 
uh, has agreed that we've got a pretty good thing that we're doing. And so they're, uh, they're financing our expansion into two additional schools uh, in, in the CPS network. We're hoping for 20 schools, and we're hoping that we can, can work uh, in the entire region so that not only those 20,000 jobs that, that are currently uh, vacant, uh, we, we try to fill, but according to uh, projections, there are going to be 450,000 vacant jobs in the region in the next 10 years and 3 million in the country. So there's still a great deal of opportunity for us to, to kind of see the change. The other road we want to take is um, we put a team together to explore buying a lot of these companies with people from the community, some of the workforce possibly, mm -hmm. because 99.1% of these companies are white male owned and most of them are aging baby boomers and many of the people that work in the, the organizations are, are, are graying, you know, the gray tsunami is upon mm -hmm. us, which means if we don't do something about the succession gap, because a lot of these right. companies haven't thought, thought about that. Um, if we don't do something, then these companies go away and those jobs go away. So in order to maintain that part of our thrust is also to, to explore ownership, which is another kind of exciting kind of look at this. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, Rakim, you looking at maybe owning a plant one of these days? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on track to become the foreman at my job um, next, and then they a lot of people tell me I'm going to be plant manager one day, and hopefully I will be. Yeah, we'll put him through a few, get him, you know, some some see. MBA, Northwestern MBA classes, and yeah, we'll get him ready. Well, I think I, I think the fact that you're here on a Friday afternoon, um, it, you know, it's a late on a Friday afternoon, the end of the day, um, just before the weekend, and you're, you know, sharing your story. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. It says a lot, and we're we're really happy to hear your story, success story, and wish you the best moving forward too. Um, so continued success to you and to Manufacturing Renaissance. And David, um, could you just tell everybody how to get in touch or where they can find more information or um, about the organization? Sure. And thanks, thanks for having us, Amy. We appreciate it. Um, Anytime. You, we'll do it again. Yeah, we'll do it again, right? We, we can, <laughs> if it doesn't uh, record, we'll do it again. <laughs> well, when you're in, in town, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to take you to, to our, our kind of flagship school so you oh, can Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, and meet some of our young people that are, you know, behind Rakim coming up now. I would so, love that. Anyway, um, uh, our website is www.mfgren.org and you can call us at 773-278-5418 and my extension is 19. Um, we're always happy to, you know, kind of talk about possible mm -hmm. collaboration. Uh, we certainly welcome any uh, funders that might have an interest in, in helping us kind of expand this. This, And I can get you a lot more information. We, we're a group that, that studies what we, we do and make sure that our best practices are founded on, on, on solid, solid work. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff I could send out if, if you guys are interested. Oh, perfect. And I'll include your contact information, too, in the body of the post. Um, as well as the description, um, I'm sure I'll, I will be posting this on YouTube, so we can get more, you know, more shares and more eyeballs there. as well. So, all right, there. well, thank you guys. It's been nice see, you. seeing you again. Right. Have see you a in great Chicago. weekend, uh, right. and uh, look forward to talking to you again sometime. Take care. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Bye now.